Look at that beautiful Devonian shale, Ohio shale. A soft mudstone originally laid down in an ancient ocean or shallow coastline. See how, see how soft that stuff is? See how it just comes off in plates? The river cuts through it very easily. It's a roughly 380 million year old mudstone. 380 million years ago. It was uh, before the Carboniferous era, which laid down all the coal. How about, a, I don't know, 180 million years before the dinosaurs evolved? You can see how much topsoil there is too. See all that stuff on top? So the bedrock's about six to eight feet beneath the, the topsoil. Topsoil being a mixture of decomposing organic debris as well as weathered rock. Now, leaving a river behind and walking past the massive thicket of poison ivy that exists at the forest edge, we walk into the understory of these wonderful uh, woodlands, this uh, wonderful shady understory of woodlands, probably sometimes used for cruising. Uh, it is suburban Cleveland. I completely understand. We look at this cool species of onion, all right, in the genus Allium, uh, which is so abundant in the understory and flowering now. If you'll notice, it's not actually producing any leaves at the moment. The leaves were already out. They were photosynthesizing in spring, doing their thing before the leaves on the forest above had emerged. And so they were cooking up, uh, occupying this ecological niche, cooking up, cooking up carbohydrates via photosynthesis like all the spring ephemerals want to do. And you can see the fact that they have no leaves right here when we look at this this uh, particular individual. You could see the, the bulbs right there, right? These are uh, related to amaryllis. They're, uh, they're in the same family. Amaryllidaceae, but in their own subfamily. It used to be, it's, the onion family used to be its own family, but it was always known it was pretty closely related to amaryllis. But upon looking at the DNA, they actually lumped it in. Uh, regardless, you can see there's the bulbs. There's no leaves coming out. The leaves were already out. They were already cooking up carbohydrates. And so this thing is just flowering now. I can find the energy to flower without having any leaves because uh, it's already cooked up enough energy in those tuberous bulbs. So uh, let's scratch it and see if it does indeed smell like onion. Allium's a big genus. There's there's quite a few hundred species of onion. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely wild leeks. Are they edible? Yes, of course, but just should you eat them? You can if you want, it's better off, you're better off just, you know, snag, snagging a few seeds in a month or two when these, uh, Flowers are done and just growing them in your backyard. You take from habitat from what little bits of habitat are left. For me personally, it's kind of stupid. You could do it if you want to, but uh, other things depend on this, other life forms depend on it. Just take it home, kill your fucking lawn, grow it there. All right? If you, you want to, you know, find a way to bond with plants, as I don't blame you for wanting to do, you don't, you don't have to go out into nature like a consumer and take, take, take. You could just uh, take them home and grow them yourself, thereby uh, serving two purposes, not just destroying habitat but also increasing the plant's population anyway so this is flowering now and like uh, all flowering plants if they're pollinated uh, which this uh, evidently was pollinated i was seeing bees just land on it like all flowering plants that'll later produce a fruit all right and a fruit in the case of allium is a dry capsule and uh, there's little black flaky seeds inside See, that's the, that's the fruit maturing right there. See, those flowers are already pollinated. Those are green swollen ovaries with three lobes to them. Each one of those lobes will have a bunch of tiny black seeds inside. Come back in a month or two, they'll be beige, the tissue will be dead, and uh, they'll be uh, dehissing. That just means cracking open. Or you might have to do it yourself if they're already, if they're just going from beige or from green to beige. If they're just going from green to beige, you can just pluck them yourself and uh, put them in your pocket, put them in a little paper envelope, and then bring them home, put them on your table in a little bowl or something, and they'll eventually dehiss. They'll finish maturing there. So you don't need to be here at exactly the right time. You know, you can broaden it a little bit. Broaden that window a little bit just by, uh, you know, plucking the whole thing off when it's done. And it's fine to do because this uh, tissue will all die, and uh, the plant will effectively go dormant again, just dying back to that tuberous bulb, that little storage tuber, that little storage locker in the ground right there. Look at all that allium. All that allium trichocum. See that? The native, the native Midwest and Eastern onion. Look at that little toad. Look how nice he blends in. Where'd he go? There you go. See that? He's evolved the mimicry, the perfect camouflage for the leaf litter on the ground. Yeah, don't blow, don't blow leaves away either. Leave the, leave the fucking leaves, right? You neurotic fuck at the end of the year. That's what people in the Midwest do. They always like to blow the leaves, you know? Men, these, these fucking men just need something to do. That's all this shit comes down to. A sense of purpose, all right? 
All right, mowing lawns, raking leaves. Change your sense of purpose to cultivating this shit. Stop, stop uh, doing the Sisyphusian task of pushing a boulder up the fucking hill. Well, look at those, uh, is it cyanobacterial colonies of, of, uh, of slime? What's going on down there? All those carotenoid pigments in that stuff. And then across the pond you could see massive thickets of our native hibiscus. The Midwest native hibiscus, hibiscus moschutos. Hibiscus is a large genus, got quite a few species in it. You can see a bunch right here. I don't know why this is not more common. I mean, it you know, it needs wet feet, but it's it's generally so, it's so much summer rain, at least compared to other environments I uh, do botany in, in the Midwest, uh, that, uh, you know, you could probably, you could grow this fine in a landscape. Look at that, the stigma. So you got all those little bits in there. Those are the stamens. That's where the pollen comes from. And then this thing is where pollen, hopefully from another plant, uh, to ensure good outcrossing, uh, this is where pollen from another plant is deposited by bees on those five stigma lobes, looking like little stalked discs. What a great plant. Look at that thing. Holy shit, a native hibiscus. There's so many. Oh, hibiscus is not just a tropical genus, although most people associate it with that. And look at that massive epicalyx, those spiky bracts that subtend the uh, main calyx right here, that green thing, which is just the conglomeration of sepals. How about that? See, and there, there's the old fruits right there. See those brown capsules? So you want to come collect cedulus? Once these flowers are done at the end of the season, come by, just grab the brown capsules that will be in the place of where these, uh, these flowers are right now. They'll have a bunch of tiny seeds inside. So uh, take them, give them a cold strat or not. Uh, try both. Cold stratification or not, just sow them and grow the shit out of them. What's this guy doing? He's stuck in her. He's stuck. He's trying to get at something. Oh, see? at the, at the the Look at those. In between the, the uh, petals. Maybe there's a little bit of nectar going out. I don't know. I thought, I thought he's just collecting collecting pollen mostly, but apparently there's something else down there. This right here is Frangula ulnus. And the, the genus Frangula is in the buckthorn family Ramnaceae. And this is, a, this is an invasive species. This is another invasive species in a buckthorn family. Instead of just Ramnus cathartica, which is also invasive as hell here. We do have native species in the genus Frangula, but uh, for some reason... Nobody planted those, and you know people introduced this fucking European and Asian one, and so it cut loose and broke loose, and now this is just spreading. So I always try to stick with the natives, the things that evolved for millions of years in the place where you live, rather than some exotic shit from 5,000 miles away that lacks any ecological context. There we go, Prunella vulgaris, mint family Lamiaceae, another ubiquitous invasive brought over from Europe. It just uh, has overtaken so many places in the Midwest and East Coast. Sure, it's attractive, but if that's, you know, the lowest common denominator metric by which you're uh, measuring whether you want to plant a, you know, whether you want to learn to appreciate a plant species or not, that's pretty fucking low. Oh, this is a nice one. Mimulus ringens, the native monkey flower. So many weird species in the deserts out west. But, uh, but here, you got this, uh, I think there's only one or two. Frymaceae is the family in uh, the order Lamiales. Bilaterally symmetrical flower, perfect for a bee to land on and stick its little ass out of that, uh, that uh, monkey mouth opening to the corolla, as you can see right there. Oh, look, at, look at those trichomes on the, the flower as well. And of course, thousands upon thousands of tiny seeds will, uh, will be produced in that uh, calyx right there. The fruit is in that calyx, that conglomeration of green sepals. Look at this one. This is a nice one. Youp perfoliatum. Eupatorium perfoliatum, because it's got perfoliate leaves, okay? Clasping leaves, just like Silphium perfoliatum. See how the, the shoot seems like it just pops right out of the center of the leaf right there? Very, very unique texture to it. Oh, look at the hairs. Hairs on everything, nice texture to the leaves. And then millions of tiny stevia flowers, because it's in the same tribe as stevia, the Joe Pieweed tribe, Eupatorii, in the center of that inflorescence. You can see one in Volucar right there has about i don't know 20 little flowers in it each one of those little brown anther tubes corresponds to one flower look at this one here's a lobelia for you Campanulaceae is the family little red flowers Lo lobelia cardinalis little red flowers not emerging yet but you could see that calyx that lobelioid calyx which is so distinct anywhere you go in the world you see a lobelia species because this genus is uh is pretty uh is pretty widespread because it produces tiny seeds, at least that's, I imagine that's why it's so widespread. But that calyx, you'll see that same calyx, even if you can't see the flower, 
you see that same calyx. Similar structure to that calyx. See that? If you look at some of the cool little bees, I was seeing some nice little bees in the Dominican Republic. Those also hummingbird pollinated like this one. Hummingbird and Lepidopteran on this guy right here. Seems to like wetter areas where it can grow in full sun. And then right here at the side of the dock, all right, overtaking this plant. Oh yeah, it looks like it's overtaking Cephalanthus. I just realized I didn't even pay attention to what the host plant was on this parasite. All right, this member of the Morning Glory family that's an obligate parasite. Cuscuta is the genus here. See that? There's a the tiny little flowers. Looks like silly string. Looks like looks like some teens came out here and just sprayed silly string all over the goddamn plants. All right, thinking they're funny. All right, getting the geriatrics all worked up who come out here to fish, making them mad. You know, which I think is actually kind of funny. But uh, anyway, Cuscuta's all over the place. You got uh, species all over the place. Quite a few species in North America adapted to... Uh, marshes wetlands bogs as well as deserts there's some really nice ones in south texas that are quite rare but they all do this they just kind of wrap themselves around a host plant and then there's places i didn't even look to see if i could show you one but uh it's certainly going on there's places where they inject a little hostorial root into the stem of the host plant and just draw nutrients from it so uh so there you go and they're always orange like that and they got those tiny little white flowers again convolvulaceae morning glory family there you go see those tiny little white shits yeah see there's another one see growing on cephalanthus which is in the coffee family rubiaceae it's an aquatic riparian member of the coffee family button willow is the common name really really great plant too produces these little uh yeah they look like a little white globe composed of a bunch of tiny flowers smells really good pollinators love it but the cuscuta is parasitizing this individual right here gotta watch out for the poison ivy right there don't get an ass rash this is a cool fern cool native fern and there's the reproductive structures. There's the leaf. There's the reproductive structures. The sporophylls. Look at that. Looking like little grapes. Onoclea sensibilis. The sensitive fern. The frost fern. Because supposedly it dies back really quick in late fall when you get in the frost. Or early spring. This shit is... Look at it. Look how nice that looks. Don't you want that? Don't you want a little bit? Look, there's some over here too. Some rather large ones. Anyway, there's that Lobelia cardinalis going off. You can see why it's such a stunner. Why it's such a banger. And why the Hummers love it so much. And probably the Lepidopterans too. The butterflies. Get those red tube-shaped flowers with that distinct lobelioid calyx. And then you get that little pollen presenter coming up with that purple anther tube. See if you could see it right there. Where is it? Yeah, there you go. See that? Looks like a little curved anther tube. All lobelias have flowers that produce a little curved anther tube. The anthers are on the inside and that little red thing poking out of it looking like a dog dick is the style. So it, it does secondary pollen presentation like a lot of the uh, sunflowers do. They're in the same order, Asteralis. That little thing comes out, pushes pollen out, presents pollen. Once pollinators remove the pollen, then it becomes uh, functionally female, and, uh, and pollen is deposited on it, and then that, those pollen grains germinate and uh, pollinate the ovary at the base, at a calyx right there, and then you get you know thousands of tiny seeds. This is nice right here, look at this. Look, Liriodendron tulipfera, okay? This is a massive tree, but it's just a little guy just getting started. Look at that unique leaf shape right there and also look at those little bracteoles on either side uh, of the node right there how about that huh relative of magnolia is incredibly beautiful flower when it's going off the you know, tree the, the trunk looks like a big ass totem pole when they're full grown wish there were more of those in chicago beautiful native tree see that oh that felt nice now i feel like i i've been spiritually recharged and i have what it takes to go out and encounter the uh, nice dragonfly the spiritual nausea induced by suburban Cleveland. No offense to anybody who lives there, but let's be honest. Huh? I seen you here. I know what you're I know what you're doing. There we go. We got this uh you know it's an it's a it's a well, healthy or unhealthy mixture of invasives and natives here, as you would expect in most places where humans have been for a long time. That said, uh, I'm I'm admiring the flowers of this invasive solanum. Look at it. Oh, I never noticed you got little nectar glands. You get little nectar. You see those green shits? It's going to induce the pollinators to get the, get get up in there. Yeah, see that? Look, that's like a little, it's like a little UV attractant. But at the end of the day, you still have, and they're withered now, so I can't really show them to you. You still have anthers with holes at the end of them. You have porocidal anthers for the buzz pollination. Because that's how all species of selenum, including tomatoes, get pollinated via buzz pollination this one's actually toxic though so don't go eating it oh look at it it's the mystery snail an invasive mollusk 
You could see him right there all covered in the, uh, in the muck and the mire with the shit. Moving around. Mystery snail. No mystery how it got here, though. It uh, likely escaped from the pet trade. Look at that. He's moving. He's looking like a moving little turd. I appreciate him. Not in this ecosystem, but where he's native. See, there's the old flowers of that. Oh, no, there's one blooming right now. See, there's that button willow. Cephalanthus accidentalis. Button willow, the town in California, is actually a really terrible place. Filled with tweakers and oil drillers. Just overall bad scene. You know, the STD clinic there is probably a fucking nightmare. Anyway, look at that beautiful flower. It smells really good. You got a bunch of little tiny flowers actually composing what looks like a single flower, a sudanthium. When that happens, it's called a sudanthium. All right, bunch of tiny flowers composing what looks like one single flower. Each individual flower has a single style poking out of it, and you can see those uh, those stamens, those black anthers, uh, down inside the corolla. This thing's fucking everywhere, man. Deserts of Sonora, Mexico, Northern California, wherever the shit. Cephalanthus occidentalis is everywhere. You got those opposite leaves and uh, the unique uh, flowers, the uh, inflorescence structure. And then the flowers, of course, have four petals. Look at that. We got panic grass. See? Dicanthelium. And then we got uh, our nice Vernonia. All right? Wonderful native member of the Asteraceae, the sunflower family. Look at those pink flowers. No daisy rays, no ligules. Quite a few species. I think this is Vernonia gigantea, but honestly, I didn't look at the, the key and flora of North America, and I don't really care that much, so I couldn't tell you, but I do appreciate the shit out of it. Love you. Okay, this is kind of cool to see. Okay, this is the genus Hypericum. There's like two or 300 species in it. The genus of St. John's Wort. A bunch of them look the freaking same, but this is the native one. Okay, there's a couple invasive ones. This is the native one. You can see, yeah, the shape of the leaves, uh, kind of ovate, a little bit of a a uh, slight tooth, well, not tooth, but punctate margin. That's the name punctatum. See those little black punctate glands on it? Uh, and uh, the leaves, of course, like I said, are opposite each other. Glabrous, no hairs, and then those, those little yellow St. John's wort flowers, and all the St. John's wort flowers generally look the same, are clustered together somewhat densely at the ends of those shoots. Looking at the flowers, you can see you have many stamens, many stamens, okay? Not just four or five, but many stamens surrounding a uh, ovary in the center right there. Five petals, sometimes you got four, but uh, the many stamens thing's a big giveaway for the flower structure there. See, and it's just growing here kind of close to a wet environment. That's cool. I see a lot of invasive members of this, uh, this genus, and it's rare you actually see the native ones. How about that? How many people in a suburban Cleveland landscape are uh, miserable or very angry just on a day-to-day -day basis? I'm going to go. I'm going to hazard a guess and say quite a quite a lot. You know, this does kind of give vibes like it's a, a petri dish for the personality of a mass shooter. This definitely seems like a kind of place where someone would kill another person in a road rage incident. <laughs> 